Maranatha, everyone. This is Pastor Jed, and this is another edition of my weekly video blog, Apologetics in Prophecy. And as we like to look at things that are prophetic in nature, that are happening in the world around us in the days that we're living, we always want to make sure that we approach them with an apologetical and biblical lens to make sure that we are not making stuff up, but making sure they fall in line to what the Bible says about the times that we're living in today. And um, today, I want to look at something that I'm entitling New Apostolic Reformation or New World Order. That's the prophecy update for today. As the last few weeks, we've been delving into uh, the things that are happening in our world right now with COVID-19. Uh, we know, as we've discovered through the, their own websites and their own um, events and, and activities and actions that they have done, that the globalists have not stopped short of turning this pandemic into a power play to push for a one world government. We know that these things that are put in place right now, these these stay at home measures and the, the stay and all these um, rules that we are now following to be good citizens across the globe, not just in the United States, were put forth and pre-planned by the event 201 that happened last year, before all of this took place. And all of those were the who's who's of the, of the, of the globalists. And we know the Bill Gates and the Rockefellers and the, the banking industries, the CDC, the UN, the, U, the, the WHO were all involved in this event that role-played the the exact thing that we're going through right now and of course they used this virus this thing to push their agenda and they never uh they always take it full advantage of any world crisis that they can as i had mentioned in a previous update about the dry run that they have now succeeded in knowing that even though this might not be the one event that causes the world to come together and form a one world government, there will be an event in the future that will. And so we know, and we saw that all the things that are um, now that they their dry run was successful, and now the power play with all the banking industries and the pharmaceutical companies and the and the, the players have received their money. They now have power to vaccinate the whole world. And we looked at that, the tools that were last week, that you really can't make the stuff up that all these things are put in place now that could very well lead to what will happen during the tribulation period for the mark of the beast and the one and and all those things that we saw. And so today I want to look at uh, another startling trend that we see that it, and that is the last days church. What the church looks like in the last days and really the root behind it and where it is leading. And of course, we're going to look at the extreme of it, where a lot of it is coming from, unknowingly for a lot of mainline Christian thinkers and talkers and movers and shakers, but where it's ending up is the same place. And so we're going to look at that. But first, I want to read some scriptures to describe to you what the Bible says that the church of the last days will look like when that right before the return of the Lord or right before the rapture of the church. And we're going to see uh, that church in full bloom today in a local event that's happening around my area. So let's go ahead and read. And we're going to start and look at what is lonely known, as we know, as the Laodicean church. This is the church of the last days. This is um, we know that the seven churches in Revelation not only speak of seven literal churches during the first century, but they also speak prophetically in nature of the seven church ages that would happen. And of course, the last three are churches that are still around at the time of the return of Jesus Christ. And I believe two of them will be left behind and one will be raptured, and that is the Philadelphian church, the remnant church, as we like to call it. But we know that there is a church that we affectionately call the lukewarm church. But let's just read uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through, um, we're just going to take it down to um, 20. And it says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you, need, that you are neither hot, cold, nor hot. I, I could wish that you were cold or hot. 
So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint yourself with eyes with, with eye solve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous. And what's the point? Repent. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, dine with him, and he with me. And so we see the picture of this church that is not only lukewarm, that is because they are self-sufficient. They are trusting in themselves. It says that they say that they are rich, have become wealthy, and they need of nothing. They no longer need God. They no longer need cry out to Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. They know they are self-sufficient. They are people that have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, and they are comfortable with their lives because they have created their lives. And we're going to see shortly what that looks like. We know that the last day's church will look like that. And we also know that in um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, we see the Spirit expressly says that in later times, or the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So we know that part of the church that will be self-sufficient, that will be lukewarm, that will uh, pretty much be more reliant on themselves and their own lives than they will of God's glory, will also be living, they'll be departing from the truth of the gospel and turning to doctrines of demons. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But that is also explained a little bit more. In 2 Timothy, uh, Paul describes a little bit more of what it would look like with the church in the last days. And he says, but know this in chapter verse three, chapter one of 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 Second uh, Timothy, it says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. And it goes on and talks about all the sins of this of self. And we saw already that the last church days church is marked by selfishness, by self-love, by their need to, for their prosperity and their wealth and their, and their desire to have things. And so do we see the church like this? Well, as I've talked a lot on this show, uh, a lot about several different things that have uh, come to our mind, but there is, and I've dealt with this in, um, in very uh, various um, uh, shows on here that uh, there is a a belief in eschatology, uh, the way that we believe of the last days, the return of Jesus. And it's a very, um, I believe it's heretical myself because of where it comes out of. And it's called New Apostolic Reformation. And it's really just a, a new form of post- millennialism. Now, remember, there's pre- and post-millennialism. We are pre-millennial, meaning that we believe that Jesus comes back at the end of the seven-year tribulation period to begin the kingdom age, the millennium kingdom mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. And so post-millennialism is kind of like it's, it's what it's saying is that the millennium is just a analogy of the church age. And that there's several forms of post-millennialism, but the part that New Apostolic Reformation plays, that they believe that it's the church's job to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth. And that by making the earth better through revivals and through music concerts and conferences, that we can make the world a better place so good that when the church finally floods the earth and becomes righteous, that Jesus will return to his perfect bride. See, there's a lot of problems with that, and that is it's not biblical, and two, that it's works-based. It means that we are the ones that are perfecting the church and not Christ, and we're going to see uh, a lot of problems with that. And so they believe that there is not the, there's only a one coming of Jesus, there isn't a rapture of the church, that he comes at the end of the 
the the the this millennium period that the church is in after the church uh, finally floods the earth with great revival. And a lot of these places like uh, Bill Johnson up at uh, Bethel Reading and of course Jesus Culture, they believe that they're going to do this through conferences that include music concerts. And that's how we're going to raise up revivalists to go out into all the world. And they are going to, uh, and these people are actually born out of health and wealth and miracle working prosperity teaching uh, pastors and leaders that we believe are heretical. They believe that they're preaching another gospel because they're preaching another Jesus. A Jesus that wants, that says that if you're not healthy and wealthy, then you're, then you're, you don't have enough faith. That is, that is and. That is against what the Bible teaches about Christianity, and I believe that it's another gospel because they're preaching another Jesus. And so it's dangerous that now that they have this end times view that has been that most people are unaware of. They are vo very outward vocal NAR or New Apostolic Reformationists, but they don't even know it and they don't even call it. I found a really good article online and I want to read this before we move on. And it says it was from Biola College and it was from a few years ago. And it, I thought it was very well. I thought it was well written. And so I want to read it because they explain it a lot better than I can in the amount of time that we have today. And it says a new reformation that many don't realize they've joined. And this is going to make a lot of sense when I share something that is going on locally that is really a problem. And, and after I get this, I'm going to explain the root of the problem, share this with you and, te and let you decide whether or not what I'm saying is being uh, shown in what the modern day church today is doing. And is it the church that we just mentioned in the Bible? Okay, new reformation, a new reformation that many don't realize they've joined. If you thought apostles and prophets only lived way back in Bible times and have long since disappeared, think again. Contemporary people calling themselves apostles and prophets have many followers. They are vigorously active in churches in the United States and throughout the world. Odds are, some are active in your own community. These men and women claim they have the God-given authority, divine strategies, and miraculous powers needed to advance God's earthly kingdom so that Christ can return. And they offer people a choice. If you submit to their leadership, then you too will work mighty miracles. You'll become part of a great end-time army that will bring about a world revival and cleanse the earth of evil by calling down hailstones, fire, and other judgments of God described in the New Testament book of Revelation. If you, sub, uh, if you do not submit to their leadership, then at the very least, you will miss out on God's end time plans. And if you actively op op oppose the apostles and prophets, then brace yourself for the fallout. Others must be warned that you are the pawn of a powerful demon known as the spirit of religion. So they'll 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 say that you're you're just a religionist you're of the old school you're you're not part of the new wave you know and they they they'll they'll or the they, their favorite term is is to use that hey man don't judge God's anointed you know what I mean that's they love that one that is like the the one verse that they stand behind that if you try to show them that what they're teaching is unbiblical and even heretical they will always say hey don't judge the Lord's anointed. You know, because they have special revelation that you don't have. This may sound radical and unappealing, but the new apostolic reformation, or NAR, as a lot of people call it, is growing rapidly. In the United States, it began taking off in the 1980s and 1990s when prophets and apostles started showing up in churches. Today, about 3 million people in the United States attend churches that openly embrace NAR apostles and prophets, and that would be Bethel Redding, and Jesus culture. They both are open about, you know, signs and miracles and 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 health and wellness. They they believe that. They teach it. And so and and uh and it says here they 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 and it says and that number includes many Pentecostal and charismatic churches that have not openly embraced these leaders yet have been influenced by their teachings in various degrees. People in these churches read best-selling books by NAR prophets like Rick Joyner's The Final Quest, or, from Bethel Redding, Bill Johnson's When Heaven Invades Earth. So, because they, they believe that when they pray, 
on earth as it is in heaven, that prayer is saying that we, the church, are praying to bring heaven down to earth, that it's the church's job to be heaven on earth, and and that, you know, that that we are the one put bringing the kingdom to earth. It's the church's job and not Jesus when he returns. And so you can see the problems with that. It says that Bill Johnson's When Heaven Invades Earth, or they use a new widely pop popular NAR Bible called the Passion Translation. I have actually heard Calvary Chapel pastors use this translation. So you can understand where it's how it's influencing churches that don't agree with their eschatology, but yet allow their church teaching to influence the church. And uh, produced by Apostle Bill Simmons, who claims that Christ visited him personally and commissioned him to release this new translation. And so it goes on, and we see um, that, uh, and I really don't need to get more into it. If you really want to know a good website to go to if you have uh, questions about um, things like this, it's it's called gotquestions.org. That's it, just gotquestions.org. They're pretty solid. Um, I've never found anything that I that I question about their answers, but they have really good um solid biblical answers to questions like cults and stuff like that. And it says, what is the new apostolic reformation? Well, it's called NAR. It's an unbiblical religious movement that emphasizes experience over scripture, mysticism over doctrine, and modern day apostles over the plain text of the Bible. And of course, what we explained is, from our standpoint, being about prophecy, that their eschatology states that they are bringing the kingdom. They are post-millennialist. They don't believe in a millennial kingdom. They believe the church is the millennium and that we will build a kingdom here on earth through revival meetings and through revivalists, mostly through artists, that if you buy their music, you're aiding into the plan to, to, to build, but you're really building their kingdom, not God's kingdom. And so, but a lot of this, where, how has it started? Where, where is the influence for a lot of these things happening in the church, especially when it comes to experience that we know is heretical? We know there's so much uh, her heresy in those charismatic movements about the, you know, the health and wealth, but it's really all boils down to two different world views. And a worldview that has been dangerous in the church for many years. It started in the 1800s. It's always been there, but it's really started to influence the church and church leaders. And it's 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 called and and it's it's integrated itself into church. And it's really called humanism. Now, um, a lot of liberal churches have changed their names throughout the years. Uh, from you know from mod from from modernism progressivism to postmodernism to the emergent church and they're really just the liberal church that has been repackaged over and over again that basically what they do is they they're integrationist that's what we call it. it's where they take bi the bible their belief in god their christian faith and they integrate it with humanism and the two are actually diametrically opposed to each other how do we know that because basically, humanism is, and this is basically, I've gotten this from another pastor, Paris Reed has a really good teaching back in the 60s called Ten Shekels of a, and a Shirt. If you look it up and you listen to it, you'll, you'll understand. He describes it very well. But basically, humanism teaches that the chief end of man is his happiness. But we know that, that, that as a Christian, for a Christian, a true born-again believer, we no longer live with that model. Our model is the chief end of man is God's glory. And so humanism that teaches that the chief end of man is, is his happiness. And for a born-again believer, we no longer, we've died to that world. We are no longer humanists. We are now Christians. And we live for the glory of God. Everything that we do in life from the way we live our life to the to, to how we how we look at the bible every activity that we do should be for god's glory now we struggle with our sinful nature that deals with self and that's has to do with idols of the heart and that issue but that has nothing to do with humanism and integrationism hurting the church and 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 creating doctrines and do, i call them doctrines of demons like the new apostolic 
Reformation. So it's something we need to be aware of. You need to understand that, that I, and I did a teaching on this, I think at the beginning of this year or last year, if you go back and look, I talked about some things that were influencing the church unknowingly. It's just like the article said that, 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 that people are influenced by Bill Johnson. A lot of people are influenced by Jesus culture and their books and their material, and they don't call themselves New Apostolic Reformation, but it affects their belief system. And it brings a humanistic, integrationist system that is actually leading people astray. Because no longer are they coming to Christ for God's glory, but they're coming to Christ for what I can get from God. That is not the gospel. If you come to Jesus Christ because you want him to make your life better, if you want to be a Christian for the goodies that I can get from God and the benefits, that is not, that is not the way you get saved. You get saved when you repent and you come to the end of yourself and you fall down before God and you repent and you ask him to forgive you your sins. And now as he comes into your life, you live for his glory, not for your own glory anymore. And so we have a lot of humanism in the church today. We have a lot of building our own kingdom and wanting to make the world a better place. And we see that as part of the new world order. The new world order wants to basically get, you know, we're all in this together, is what you hear the mantra of the COVID-19 crisis. All across the globe, we are all going to get through this together if we just pull together and we work really hard. Well, the church is saying now that if we just pull together really hard and we, 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 we do good works and we create a, a perfect world through revivalists and through meetings that Christ will see that we have created the kingdom that he will come down and rule and reign in, which is unbiblical. It is wrong. And so before I leave you today, I want to read you an article. Well, not an article. I got an email. I'm on an email chain for some of the local big churches. And this is a, a, a big mega church in our area that really is big. And so they, they're influenced by a lot of the mainline Christianity guys. And they use a lot of Christ, the, the, a lot of their uh, books that, that they, they, they frequently sell and people that they come and speak at the church are integrationist or even like Bill Johnson, who I believe has spoken at one of their churches before is, you know, full blown NAR guy. But a lot of these guys are integrationists. They're human psychologists. And, you know, in the midst of all this crisis, they're basically, you know, sharing the same mantra as the world right now. We're all in this together. We can pull together. We can get through it through through our help. You know what I mean? And they're having, you know, every year they have a leadership uh, summit is what it's called. It's called Thrive Summit. And every year they have a big leadership conference and it's either here or someplace else. But I mean, it's literally littered with the who's who's of modern Christianity. Uh, I'm looking at there. It's June and because of the COVID crisis, it's free now and online. So it's virtual. But it's really got a who's who's of the Rick Warrens and uh, Henry Cloud, who's a psychologist, an integrationist psychologist. Um, we've got, you know, it's just incredible, the people that are here. But they're all mainline Christian people. And some of them are just stars and actresses and musicians that are all coming together to to um, teach Christian leadership. These are people. This conference is is supposedly orchestrated to to teach people on how to lead in their churches and in their businesses and communities as Christian leaders. But that's not it. It's free. Anybody can attend. You can bring your staff, your family, your business, anybody you want. But every year they have a featured speaker. This would be the headline speaker. This would be the 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 big guy, the guy that everybody's going to tune in and listen to and and get the most from and break out their notepads and say this is the this is where I'm going to learn the most on how to be a leader. A Christian leader in my communities, in my families, in my church. This guy's name, and I don't even know if he's a Christian or not, because I went to his website and there's nothing in there that I saw that no testimony, no Jesus, no church, nothing mentioned. So I really think he's just a motivational guy. And But his name is Simon Sinek. I guess that's how you pronounce his last name. Okay, and, and this is his description of what he is going to be talking about at this conference. 
This will give you, and then we're going to ask a couple, we're going to ask ourselves a few questions after I read this, okay? So Simon Sinek, an, an, an unshakable optimist, he believes in a bright future and our ability to build it together. He's described as a visionary thinker with a rare intellect. Simon has devoted his professional life to help advance a vision of the world that does not yet exist. A world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe at work, and return home fulfilled at the end of the day. Simon is the author of multiple best-selling books, including Start With Why, Leaders Eat Last, Together Is Better, and The Infinite Game. So this short description of who he is, what his desire is, and what his goal is, what's that sound like to you? Does that sound like uh, the, the, the leadership teaching of Jesus Christ? Does that sound like the leadership training that we would get from Paul the Apostle? Does that sound like the leadership training that we get from Peter and his two epistles? I think not. I think this is New Apostolic Reformation packaged in motivation and leadership that they don't even realize what they're doing. This is building your own kingdom, making the chief end of yourself your happiness. That's, he doesn't hold it back. That's exactly what he says. And this is what's in the church today, people. This is the, the type of gospel that is being preached. We have people in our churches that are there because they want to be motivated to have a happy life and a better marriage. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with those things. But when they're the only thing that you're focused on and you're not focused on your relationship with God, if God is not number one in your life and you are not living, the chief end of your life is not for the glory of God, you're going to be duped and deceived and believe that you are building your own kingdom here on earth. And you are going to be led astray. You're not going to be looking for Jesus Christ. And when the man with the plan comes on the scene, and, and, and some of these people that aren't saved, that are falling for this stuff, get left behind. And that man comes on the scene. And it says in 2 Thessalonians that he is going to deceive many by them believing the lie. And they're going to follow his deception thinking he has the answer to everything because he's going to make their life better. He's going to make their life happy because their chief end is their happiness, not for the glory of God. And they're going to be deceived to follow the Antichrist. We need to be very careful on where the kind of people that we're allowing to mentor us in our lives. Make sure that the people that you're following or learning from that, that are going to lead you are teaching you the examples found in Scripture. We don't need to build a, We're not looking for a, a, a world that does not exist that we're building ourselves. A world where the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired. I don't need to wake up inspired. I wouldn't wake up in the Word. I need to wake up and get inspired by what God has to say to me, not what this Simon guy has to say to me. And I need to understand that you need to have leaders that, are, that aren't living for themselves. They're living for the glory of God by serving others and not building their kingdoms here on earth. I thank God for my pastor. And I thank you. I thank him. You know, I thank God every day for him and the, and the way that just his leadership ability and his self-sacrifice through the years has has challenged me in my own thinking, in my own heart. And it's helped me to peel back the areas of my life that are self-centered, that are seeking my own happiness and not the glory of God. And so. I think that it's a good time right now as we go through this season that we make sure that we are vetting the people that we are listening to, that we are vetting the, 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 the there's a lot of voices out there on the, on the internet. You can Google and YouTube many voices, but we need to be careful and research and find out who they are and making sure that they're not being influenced by this false teaching, this heretical doctrine of demons that is self-centered and wanting to build its own kingdom and bringing it into your life because it can affect you without you even knowing it. And we need to be careful because those it's so important that we stay in the Word, that we get away from motivational and charismania and all the things that, that the world lives for. You know, we, we're, we're, the church is not uh, TED Talks. The church is all about the Word of God. And so 
I just wanted to show you that I found this last week. I was shocked by the fact that this is, you know, I can understand that in their mega churches, they want to bring people into church. So they have this secular stuff to fill the crowds up, to maybe share the gospel with their system of the gospel. But when it comes to training leaders, these are people that, that, that might be in our community that run our churches around here that are pretty solid and they're being sucked in because of the mainline Christianity or maybe one of these names that are connected to a Calvary Chapel somewhere. and Or, or I really like this one guy's book, so I'm going to go to this leadership meeting and they're being taught a lie. They're being taught a bad example. And we need to understand that, that, that Jesus said that if anyone wants to be a leader, he will be the servant of all. He's not going to be, you know, just be a servant. If you got a heart to serve others, God will give you the power to lead. People will follow you because you're serving them. You're living your life for them and you, they understand that you're doing it for God's glory and not for your own kingdom. And so that's all I have to say this week. But God bless you all. And I just pray that if anybody's watching this and maybe your whole relationship with God has been one of, what can I get from you, God? Before I got saved, I lived five years of my life with the Holy Spirit beating up on me. I, my relationship with God was, was basically that, God, give me this and I'll do this for you. If you give me this, I'll stop doing that. And through God's grace, training me about his forgiveness and his grace, he would do those things for me, but I kept failing on my end. And it kept, I kept getting defeated. And so when you try to live, when you have a relationship where you're expecting God to give you things and God doesn't give them to you, you're going to be angry at God and you're not going to have a true relationship with God. And maybe you don't even have a real relationship for God. Maybe you've been living for yourself all this time. And now you realize that by living for self, my whole purpose has been for my own personal happiness and not for the true glory of God. And you need to understand that that is sin. The Bible calls that idolatry. It's making a God in your own image. And that's the second commandment. But we are to love the Lord our God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if you're not doing that today, maybe that you've, I've just opened a can of worms in your heart that you've never realized that today is the day that you can repent Remember what Jesus said to the days of church. He didn't say that, 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 that it was, they were finished and that was it. He said, no, hear what I'm saying to you and repent. I stand at the door and I knock. And God, Jesus is knocking at your door today and says, I want to come in and be the glory in your life. I want to change your heart so you no longer live for yourself, but you live for me. And what a glorious life that is. We no longer have the burden of our idols, of our heart on our, on our shoulders, but we have the, the yoke of Jesus, which is easy and light and freedom. It's such freedom. And so if that's you today, all you have to do is just get on your knees and pray and ask Lord, the Lord to forgive the idols of your heart, to forgive you for living for yourself and that you want to receive the forgiveness for your sins that is promised to you from the cross of Jesus Christ Put your faith and trust in him today and you will be saved. And then ask God to start revealing the things in your life. And you're only going to find that when you read the word. Don't go to conferences like this. Don't pick up books by psychologists. You don't need that. The word of God has everything you need for life and godliness. So with that said, I, 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 I pray that pretty soon, um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to meet again in the church with social distancing practices. Uh, but we're going to get back into our uh, looking at the world in whole next week on our updates. And I wish you all well. God bless you.